for the candy. No. She said nobody wants this, so I'm just making it. So, once again, welcome everyone. We're so glad uh, to have you all here. We're going to start the awards uh, program now. And for the first award, I'm going to hand it over to Cecilia. She uh, nominated Dr. Fogg for this uh, award, and so she's going to do the presentation. Dr. Fogg, if you could come up and uh, join us. <laughs> so, uh, Reverend Lehman just asked me to uh, describe how this process goes. We are presenting four awards tonight, uh, two Sydney Adams Awards, one for clergy, and one for a layperson, Sydney Adams was a, a long time executive minister of the Indian Church Council. And those two awards go to people who have some relationship to the uh, council and the member churches. Uh, Dr. Falk happens to be a member of uh, our church, Congregational Church of uh, South Dartmouth. Uh, several years ago, we started a uh, separate award uh, for volunteers who aren't necessarily uh, doing work in relation to the council, but do good volunteer work in the community uh, as well. And that award was um, named after George Ripley, Phyllis King, and Harry Shumming, who was also a member of our church. And then we have a, uh, a, a fourth award we're presenting tonight. It's uh, only the second time we've done it. It's a community award, and it's for somebody that uh, goes above and beyond uh, in the, the greater community and um, serves this community well. So those are the four awards we are presenting tonight. Nominations go to our board of directors, and the board of directors uh, votes on the, on the winners. Uh, so that's how the award winners are determined. And so I'll uh, turn it over to Cecilia to present the first award. <coughs> so just a little out of order for my thoughts, but as I stand here um, trying to describe Dr. Fogg um, in uh, two minutes or less, um, it's not an easy thing to do as it is with any of our awards recipients uh, over the years. So. I know Dr. Fogg from a uh, church member, and one of the things that um, quickly came to mind when they were talking about this, I said, well, Dr. Fogg, you know, and one of the things that Dr. Fogg <laughs> always does he here at church is he always asks about the kids. Our daughter, Stephanie, how's Stephanie doing? She hasn't been here probably in five years because she lives out of town, but he always wants to know how the kids are doing. Um, and that's very important to him. So it is my honor to present the Sydney Adams Award to Dr. C. Douglas Fogg. Dr. Fogg comes to us from a long history in medicine, spanning 42 years of hospital patient care, and many more beyond that serving the unhoused and those without medical care. His career began back in 1961, graduating from Hammerman Medical College in Philadelphia. After serving in the U.S. Navy as a medical officer, he was honorably discharged in 1971 and moved with his family here to New Bedford and began working at Union Hospital, for those of you who may even be familiar, he's the far north end um, of the city, as well as opening his private practice. In 1972, he became Chief of Surgery and later Chief of Staff at St. Luke's Hospital 
and also the medical director at the Wound and Recovery Center at the New Bedford Rehab Center. In 2015, he became involved with the Soul, S-O-L-E, Foot Clinic at Mercy Meals and More, which is a program located um, at, through the Pilgrim Church uh, in downtown New Bedford. His care for the individuals goes that, who participate there goes beyond just being patients, sharing his compassion for others to the nursing students who work with him from UMass at the clinic. His self-defined cranky surgeon title <laughs> is clearly not evident in this work. His students, who define this clinic as the best, excuse me, as the best experience they have in their clinical time at UMass, listen to his experiences and learn how to be a patient-centered caregiver. It doesn't matter who they are or where they come from, Dr. Fogg treats each of his patients with respect and dignity. He remembers their names, he takes the time to listen to their stories, and gives them a plan for their own care and always leaves them with a see you next week. His students value the opportunity to speak to a well-known, well-read surgeon. Is a quote from one of his students, I didn't think a doctor would be so nice to me and listen to what I said. Dr. Fogg is quoted as saying his family loved sailing and wanted to live on the water. It's been wonderful for our family, he said. This is our home and his family of patients, especially those underserved and unhoused of our area, have been truly blessed by his presence. We thank you, Dr. Fogg. Thank you. Seven years ago, someone at the Congo Church suggested I might go down to the Soul Foot Clinic and see if I could be of assistance. Having established an advanced wound care center in the past, and for 15 years running it, I felt I had some knowledge and skills that would be applicable to a foot clinic, so I was more than willing to go down. When I first got there, it was run by a male nurse named Arthur Briggs. And six to eight student nurses, undergraduates, juniors or seniors from the UMass Dartmouth School of Nursing came for about 10 weeks each semester. They came with a, their own director, their own instructor named Mary Ann, who I worked with for now the last seven years. Uh, Arthur Briggs retired after two years. And uh, after he retired, I volunteered to be a co-director of the <coughs> It's important to acknowledge the support uh, I've had at the clinics had, from the Pilgrim United Church in New Bedford, the faculty of the School of Nursing at UMass Dartmouth, the congregational churches of South Dartmouth and Mattapoisett have been very, very helpful. <coughs> The staff and the board of directors of Mercy Meals and More uh, has established uh, a stronger board and were much more uh, active in the community through their efforts. The managers of the, the kitchen and the Mercy Meals and More, uh, one was Laura, she was there for two or three years before she retired, and the new one is David, and he's doing a wonderful job. The many volunteers that come in on mornings uh, to serve breakfast, they have to be there at 5 a.m. We've got, uh, in the summertime, high school students, college students, who come in and maybe work for three to four, maybe six or eight weeks during our summer months. And we have other volunteers from the community. 
the nursing and the pharmacy staff at St. Luke's Hospital have been supportive of my efforts. <coughs> and we'd like to salute Big Value for their contributions to the Mercy Meals and more foot clinic. I would also like to acknowledge my wife, Sandra. For her patience, mostly, and support. Thank God for the wives. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see this really isn't just about me. I've always felt it's important to share one's knowledge and skills to help others, especially in retirement. <clears throat> Taking a page from Jim Stevens, quote, gifts to give. And I believe we all have gifts to give. Mm -hmm. We do have one challenge. Uh, the students are only there for 20 weeks a year. The other weeks, I run the clinic. I usually have a nurse that comes in and helps me, and I've had two over the last five years that were pretty regular. But since coronavirus, <coughs> I've been a one-man show. So I'm always looking for people to volunteer who would like to spend two hours on Thursday morning, starting around 6 a.m. in the morning, to give me a hand. I'd appreciate that if you know one who might be interested. Regarding the homelessness, I recommend two books. One is called Stories from the Shadows by James O'Connell, who runs a major homeless program in the city of Boston uh, and is in it internationally recognized. The other book is Answers Behind the Red Door, Battling the Homeless Epidemic by Michelle Steed and Dave Flanagan. I'd like to thank you again for this honor. get in trouble. Thank you for the husbands, for the wives that are out there. <laughs> Present the next award, I'd like to call uh, Joe Dorkey and Arif Bednaz, two of our board members, uh, to, the, to the presentation. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Reverend. I promised them I would keep this under 15 minutes for the ultimate <laughs> So if I hit 30, give me a high sign. I'll slap it before <laughs> This is a great honor for me to be here tonight to uh, co-nominate Peter. Arnip and I co-nominated him. We are both, you might call us, co-chaplains for the opioid outreach program and I met Peter back in April 2017. We went to um, training together how to help those who have overdosed and then I ended up in the uh, program helping going along with the ride-alongs and the next thing Dave Lima and Doug Cedarberg asked me to be a chaplain. And I said, great, no paperwork. And so, but I observed Peter. Peter and I have wanted, he's like a brother to me. I can't say enough nice about him. I've watched him do hundreds of hours of work beyond the scope of his job. He is just a remarkable person and he's taught me endlessly. And so it gives me great honor to be able to be here tonight to see him receive this. Oh, <laughs> she's, a, she's a teacher, she don't need So it really has been a privilege for me to work with Peter. I have never met such a kind, kind man who, no matter who you are, he has a helping hand for. And he has, like, like I can say, like Joe, he's taught me so much. And uh, I just enjoy our conversations while we're driving from place to place. <laughs> we kind of um, help each other out. You know, if we've been having a bad day or a bad week, we're, we feel we're so comfortable to be able to talk to each other about it. And I think that's an important part about the outreach that we do for not only the um, people like Peter, but also for the police officers that we ride with. So I really am privileged 
to write with Peter and to be part of giving him this award. speech and I didn't write a large print speech or anything. <laughs> this, is a, this is a huge blessing and an honor made possible by uh, a huge mm -hmm. team of people, um, you know, an extended team of people. Um, I first want to acknowledge before I uh, acknowledge anybody else that the, the core people that really started in on a lot of this groundbreaking work on uh, approaching addiction and substance use and things like that are here. So uh, the two uh, women I authority in my life, like my wife Jenna, and my director Connie from Southern Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> I know Carl and David were in there, Dave Lee were in there definitely way back when, so uh, thank you so much for everything that you put down and put forward with this. Um, I could just ask maybe a quick moment of silence for the people who are really suffering and the people who have uh, we've lost from this uh, this scourge of uh, opioid and other drug addiction. <coughs> Thank you. Um, so, I mean, it really has a lot to do with the team on the ground. I, I came into um, I came into recovery in, in 2005. Uh, it's been a rough and rocky road, you know. Um, there are many pathways to recovery from addiction, and I had my own. Um, but it's given me countless blessings that I never would have gotten if I had not experienced that. And I, I really uh, have learned to take that, take that uh, liability and, and turn it into a, a, you know, a positive um, with a lot of help. And uh, when we're able to put a team together of police officers, counselors, case managers, harm reduction workers, and um, chaplains, and all go out together and approach people who have had a near life, you know, a near life ending experience, and the very next uh, day or two, knock on their door and offer them engagement, an empathetic ear, um, resources, some life saving medications. We do a lot of Narcan, um, but we also do a lot of we also do a lot of listening. And I find that uh, you know you have two ears, one mouth, and you use them in that proportion, and you learn a lot about people. And what, you know, you learn a lot about what bothers people, and we, we don't really have a typical focus. We we have a people that uh, you know they come from all walks of life, all ages, all you know all cultures, um, all beliefs. Or, or you know some some don't really some don't really profess any belief, but they might be agnostic. Mm -hmm. They might be identifying as atheists. Um, we offer them the same listening ear, the same compassion, the same empathy that we you know, would offer anybody else. Um, and we try to get to the root of the problem. We try to get to really what's, what's driving that person's behavior uh, to get into this, 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 horrible, this horrible trap. And sometimes it's a person who just had one, one event. You know, they might have taken too much medications. A lot of these are based on pain medications and it was an accidental pain medication you know, poisoning. Um, Typically, we don't see that. Typically, we work with a lot of people who are struggling with using substances because they want to feel good, feel better, or remain in control. They don't want to go into withdrawal. Uh, so we do a lot of that. Um, but it's very, very mixed. The, the different responses you get when you knock on the door with an officer, or, you know, a harm reductionist and a, and a chaplain, you might get somebody who's telling you, look, I'm not interested in what you have to say, but thank you, I'll take the contact information. You might get somebody that, you know, the family answers and they want Narcan and they want some advice on what to do about what they're going through with a loved one. So we try to offer that and we try to engage and stay engaged with the family. You might have people who are, are ready to make a change. They've been through a horrible lot in life. They have a lot of trauma. They have a lot of uh, medical issues. They have a lot of psychological problems. They have a lot of grief. Uh, they might have been through you know, combat or something like that and been traumatized that way. You, you just don't know what drives somebody what drives somebody's behavior until you listen to them. So um, a big part of the job is just being receptive, listening, offering uh, you know, an, open, an open handshake, listening ears, and um, a chance for follow-up. Um, and that's, that's actually 
you know, a lot of that is laid down early in advance and it doesn't seem like it's going anywhere until two, three months later, sometimes a year later, they'll call you and they want to engage more deeply and we want to be there for that, you know. Um, the offices we have uh, in the New Bedford uh, Task Force are excellent. Um, I never thought I'd be riding with a police captain or a police lieutenant back in my days before recovery. Unless <laughs> I was in the back, you know. I never thought I'd have the phone numbers in my phone. I never thought I'd be, living, I'd be riding or joking around with chaplains on, the, you know, on these rides or anything like that. Um, I never thought I'd be, you know, helping other people come into the field. You know, Marissa's over here and she handles a fall river and now, in, now she's in New Bedford as well and she's... Uh, She's a big piece of the, uh, you know, the outreach now. So I really appreciate the opportunity to, to be here to acknowledge this, and um, it just, it just so huge for this team to be able to accept this, uh, for me to accept this. But I want to say it's, it's really for me, but also for everybody that's made it possible. The team at large, my family is here. They've been a huge part of my recovery. When a lot of people would have turned their back, my sister, my, my brothers never never turned their back on me. They always supported me, always were there for me, always, always stood up for me. My parents, the same thing, you know. Um, we've been through a lot together. They've certainly been through a lot together with, with me, and I really, I really appreciate it. So, um, I don't think I really had that much else. I think I said everything without reading. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my experience was a mixture. Of, you know, my recovery was a, was a mix of Christian scripture and church membership, uh, secular, secular clinical treatment, uh, my own experimentation with you know alternative medicines and things like that, um, and also uh, a lot of teaching. Uh, you know, I through this through going to school to learn a little bit about how to counsel others with addiction problems and drug use problems, I actually became an instructor part-time, so I was actually able to teach some things about that, and um, it's nice to, to be able to teach because I learn more from my students than I could ever teach them, so that, that's an awesome thing, too. And uh, congratulations, Dr. Fogg. I, I remember you're one of my surgeons. You took care of my an inguinal problem I had back when I was <laughs> <laughs> present the next award and uh, he promised me he would be less than 60 minutes. seconds for him oh, that's nice. Peter. Peter. Hi. Congratulations. I don't need the mic but, uh, since he handed it to me so uh, just real quick if Reverend Dalton can make his way up here he's going to be our next recipient but while he's making his way up here just a small world uh, Pastor Artem that was up here is out the Briggs sister. Okay? And uh, I used to go to your office once a week or once every other week with my Uncle Manny, who would curse you to no end, and I'd be embarrassed as heck as you were tending his open wound on his leg. Uncle Manny, we don't treat people that are helping you. They're not helping me, he's hurting me like. I, I edited that for you guys, okay? <laughs> but uh, you were wonderful and you helped them out a lot, so we're very grateful. Pastor Dalton, why don't you make your way over here, please? It, I actually get excited about saying this these days. I've known Pastor Dalton since the turn of the century. <laughs> Two dinosaurs. Two, two dinosaurs. Wow. I wasn't even going that far. <laughs> Pastor Dalton came to us, we were just talking about it earlier. He came to our area in 1998. And uh, neither one of us were part of the Youth Church Council at that time. And, uh, but we did meet in the Regional Community Congress, which also brought me with our next recipient into a uh, relationship with Carl Alves there. And through that, 
we became part of the Faith Network, and that's where Pastor Dalton and I first met each other. And this is the quietest, most unassuming man you ever meet in your life. He, though, is one of the most dedicated people I know. He has every right to call himself doctor and expect us to do the same thing. He teaches Greek in universities, at least he did before. Hebrew, too. Go ahead. Make me feel even worse. <laughs> I have a hard enough time with English. And you're, doing, you're doing these languages. About, how long has it been now? About 15 years? You've been part of the chaplain, see? A couple of years, two, three years after I came here, I started with Mary. Right. And he was one of our volunteer chaplains. And for those of you who don't re realize, we actually run the Protestant chaplaincy at St. Luke's Hospital. And it's a unfinanced, uh, un unfunded uh, uh, position. It's something that we as the council stepped up to pay a coordinator. And first it was under Marilyn Green, and then it was Pastor... Uh, 2013, I right, from Pastor Betty McClure. Yeah. And since 2013, Pastor Dalton has been our chaplain. Now, this the, the, the Sydney Adams Award is given to people who are volunteers. So you might ask yourself, why are we giving one to Pastor Dalton, who is a staff person? He, he's a half-time person, okay? He's more than a half-time man. <laughs> half-time uh, half hours. But here's the thing. Last year, you may have heard of it, there was this thing called the pandemic that got started. And with the pandemic came the shutdown orders and the stay-at-home orders. And the hospitals got closed to everybody except emergency personnel only, staff. We have had over the years, anywhere in terms of volunteer team, and some of you are out there, okay, Cindy Tardiff and others, who work with Dalton, he coordinates them. And so we would have a presence every day at St. Luke's. But during COVID, and especially the stay-at-home orders, there was nobody allowed, not even not in the COVID section, not allowed in the hospitals. And we fought for months, Pastor Dalton and I, to be able to figure out how do we get a presence back in there? Because there was a presence more then than ever before, the need. We were able to get Pastor Dalton back in because of the little clarification. Volunteers weren't allowed, employees were allowed. And because of our understanding of working together, he, as our employee, was allowed to go back in. Now, I think at that time we had eight or ten volunteers that worked with you? We were, at the time, 14, two per day. And that's when Pastor Dalton took it all upon himself to be the sole person that was going in every day. Well, as needed, phone call for an emergency, he would go for us. He would be there. Never a word of complaint. Never a word of anything else. I would call, are you okay? Is there some, I'd call sometimes, I'd get an answer in a day or two. But, <laughs> Dalton, is there anything you need? How can I support you? Well, I'm doing the best I can. We're feeding the people we need. <laughs> Those of you who know him best, you know. That's the best Dalton impersonation I have. But the bottom line is, this is a man who's dedicated to serve the Lord, loves his family. During COVID, he and his wife went through it themselves and were very ill. But still, when it was able to go back in, he didn't hesitate, he went. Yeah. Because that's what we do in the ministry. Yeah. So congratulations, we thank you so much. I will try to be very brief. First of all, thank you very much, Inter-Church Council, Pastor Dick, in particular for 
this recognition that I dedicate to the Lord because everything we do in ministry is out of the strength and power and ability that the Lord gives us Amen. to serve Him. So I take this and as, as an encouragement. Go on. If you're doing well, do better. Amen. We have an eye on you. <laughs> A loving eye. Not to condemn, but to encourage. To cheer on. And this is what we do to each other in the word of the Lord. In, in the ministry, I recognize that I'm not alone, as any one of us. I have a wife that has been half or more, taking half or more of the load. And I have the members of our, like our church here that have allowed me to serve the Lord at the hospital. And for many years I have been there. And I have here also members of the team that have been helping us there, visiting patients, praying and helping, and being a blessing to those who go to the hospital, whether they are members of our churches or not. As a matter of fact, maybe you don't believe, but most of the people that we, we visit at the hospital with whom we talk and we pray and we try to help, they are unchurched people. Some maybe give a Christian uh, information. I am a Christian. I, they identify themselves as a Christian, but they have never gone to church. And they yeah, never step inside a church. But maybe because they're supposed to give, you know, to say what religion they have or, you know, they profess. But we are blessing both members of our churches and many others that are not members of our churches. So this is a, 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 is a flock, is a different kind of flock that we have. So we work with the church, but we work with the patients that is a, a tremendous and specific kind of, of, of sheep that we deal with at the hospital. So I'm very grateful to uh, the members of our church that have been giving me you know, their support and the members of the team, because this award, I don't take it for myself, we take it for us as a team. And even though they have not been able to go to the hospital during, you know, till now, now they are returning. I have already two this week that, that the, the, the hospital is allowing the uh, volunteers to return. So there are some requirements, of course, but they are coming back. Thank God for that. Amen. And thank you very much for this honor. Uh, I'm grateful for you know this recognition, which is also taken as a, a humbling kind of gift because I know I'm not the one who really deserves it everybody we know that you can deserve anything but there will be always somebody that will deserve more than you isn't that right Amen. so we receive this with this kind of a humbling you know, situation you know at heart but grateful for the encouragement that this represents in our lives Amen. thank you very much So this comes to our last presentation, and this one for me is special. Not that the rest aren't, they always are. But uh, this one is going to be, this is our corporate award in, in recognizing Carl Alves and PACA and the work that they have, they have represented in our community. And over the last few years, there's been many of us who've wanted and tried to get Carl recognized as a person of leadership, of quality, uh, and the Standard Times, our local newspaper, has for years had a custom of doing Man of the Year. And I have three people who, along <laughs> with me, wrote one big long letter as to why we needed to recognize Kyle Alves as a Man of the Year. In whatever respect, they would accept him. And whether it was a town representative or the community representative or the South Coast Man of the Year, because of all that they've done for so many years on a shoestring 90% of the time. And I'm here to tell you that a lot of what I have been able to accomplish has been because of people like Carl 
and Connie Rocha Mimosa and others that we work with in the community who see that what we need to do in the churches and educate us so that we could go out and serve in the community. And so I want to thank Cynthia Walquist, Peter Muse, and Mike Jackman, who I'm inviting to bring come up, and he's going to be actually presenting this award to Cal. Mike Jackman is aide to Congressman Keating. And since last March, when COVID hit and the stay-at-home orders happened, Carl got the community to start meeting at 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock every morning. In the beginning, it was 11 o'clock every morning, seven days a week. I told him I might have you, I might be busy on Sunday. But the thing was, what were we meeting for? The needs of the community food needs. We had food insecurity. The homeless, where were they going to go to the bathroom? Where were they going to get food? Where were they going to get anything? Mike Jackman was part of those meetings along with Cynthia, along with Peter. And so when we had the opportunity and I brought it up to the board, we need to recognize Kyle. Everybody was on board. And I'm not going to say any more because I'm going to let Mike say what he's going to say, but I needed to be at least say that. Michael? Thank you, David. Uh, you want me to hold that point? No, I think I'm good. Got it. <laughs> First of all, um, I want to congratulate the other recipients um, on behalf of the congressman. Uh, I was able to present, present citations to congratulate you all. You know, David gave me a, a summary of uh, what everyone did to earn these awards, uh, the, this recognition, but really you could have just said God's work because what these people are doing is God's work. David mentioned the 11 o'clock calls. You know, I would get those reminders Saturday and Sunday doing these calls. I'm like, well, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a, I, I would ch chime in once in a while, but I really uh, wasn't able to be there for every call like some of the people were. And uh, there's a bunch of other people. Lindsay is on the call pretty much every day. Pam Cole was a call. <laughs> Connie, as you mentioned. I'm sure there are other people hiding behind their masks who I don't, I don't see. I'm only used to seeing them in a little Zoom bar, you know, <laughs> not, not in person. But, um, uh, it, 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 one thing I will say, when Carl's not on the call for the 11 o'clock call, it does not, it does, usually doesn't go, it doesn't go according to plan. Now, let me put it that way. Especially since Reverend Lima, you know, I don't want to, you know, he sometimes substitutes, he does a great job. Do a great job, Reverend. Uh, I'm not feeling it, Michael. Yeah. Well, thanks for the free meal. I appreciate it. Um, but yeah, it, it's it, on behalf of the congressman, and again, I'm personally, you know, I've worked with Carl. Uh, in his capacity uh, with PACA on the overdose uh, prevention um, work that they do there. And then when this uh, pandemic hit and there was no hesitation, really like day one, this call, this, this community response core started and uh, really has been the, the engine that has, has, um, has propelled so much work in the community uh, to help people. That's what it's all about. So, Carl, congratulations, and if you want to come up, to the next step forward. And again, on behalf of Carl, we do have a citation, just a certificate of special congressional recognition, probably presented to Carl J. Ells, recognition being the recipient of the Interchurch Council of Greater New Bedford Community Partnership Award for 2021. So, congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, on behalf of uh, my attorney, uh, Albie Cullen, uh, thank you uh, for not making me reapply after we had postponed the event to get ahead. So thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Nothing that I do, I do by myself. Everything I do is with somebody else. So I feel a little bit uncomfortable accepting this award. We can take it back. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to definitely accept this award on behalf of, as was said before, because now what a tough act to follow. You have these extraordinary human beings that are doing terrific work, and uh, here I am, and I don't even have paper. All I have is my phone because my printer didn't work at home. <laughs> um, but I, I will keep it brief as, you know, no more than two hours. The, um, I, I, I really need to start, as I can't do any of this alone. I want to start by thanking my mom, my family, 
for guiding me into service as a child, into, as a, a young adult and beyond. They've been powers of example to me. I want to thank the love of my life, Tanya, and, and my children, Madison, Christian, Jesus, Father, 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 here today. And I want to thank my extended family, my friends, my colleagues, and all the folks that help allow me to do what I do better, because I am nothing without you. I want to thank my community, which is us, right? We are the folks that are doing this work. We might not know each other, but we are community. And that's what's so exciting to me about this, this gathering, this, this award, this feeling, because everybody feels it, you know? Um, because we're doing something good. And there's a lot to, to go. I also want to think about and thank the world around us, the community at large. We have our community here and we're kind of tuned in. You're here because you see the world outside just beyond your own world, right? You know what's in front of you. But there is so much need out in the community that we have to continue to uh, work towards. And that is a gift to us. It is something um, that we need to be mindful of and keep moving forward. I feel blessed to be able to do this work. A wise person told me one time, that you, you know, to a life worth living, make good choices. I'm blessed to have chosen some great friends uh, and made some really great uh, relationships with them. But I also want to choose collaboration over isolation. Because none of us, as was said before, can do this alone. We have to do it together. But we have to work in collaboration. We have to have debates, discussions, argue, because no pain, no gain, we need to move that forward. I choose equity over privilege. It's been more apparent today than ever before in our history. And we need to include and create success for all folks in our community, regardless of their housing situation or their race, their creed, or any condition that they might. And we've got to be mindful that we do this on a daily basis, even when it's difficult. I choose empowerment and enterprise over helplessness. One of the things about the 11 o'clock, <clears throat> excuse me, the 11 o'clock meeting, I needed that for myself. Because there were times where I was like, how am I going to, I've got 50 people on my payroll, how am I going to make that happen? But seeing those faces helped me move forward. We're together. I choose contentment and gratitude over anxiety. All too often we're wondering about what has happened in the past or what's gonna happen in the future or what I don't have, what I don't have. But somebody wise told me to say, if you really wanna be happy, embrace what you have right here. Embrace this moment. So I'm doing that and I hope you will too. And I also choose optimism over hopelessness. We are going to get through this pandemic. We're gonna get through the challenges of poverty and and lack of housing and those kinds of things together. We're in, in the, the uh, dawn of a new day. Technology, lots of things are gonna be changing. The world as we know it today is gonna be much different 10 years from now. There'll be some things that are very different, different that are bad. There are gonna be many, many positive things that are good. We need to make sure that we're lifting all boats. So I'll leave you. I choose you, you, my community as the answer to these challenges. And I am proud to be part, a small part of your community. Together, we can and are changing the world. Thank you.